say welcome. It's nice to see everybody again. Happy New Year. <laughs> So um, we left off back in, was it September? Uh, the last thing that this group did was the walk uh, with Jason of that stretch of Nelson Road uh, between Hornbrook and Miller, which was a kind of a fun outing and also a really good uh, illustration of the various ways that uh, development has taken place along the roads, you know, up close and, and you know, out in, the, out in the middle of a field and, you know, hidden from sight and, you know, it's all there in that one, one block. Uh, I thought before we, well, I think, let's see, is anybody here? Yeah, John, you know, you probably should um, start by a little bit of uh, contextual, contextualizing, uh, uh, indicating where we, uh, what this group is and how it and how it relates to the bigger planning initiative. Uh, last January or February, the a planning group was was created to uh, address the larger planning issues in the town. And after a meeting for one a uh, couple of times, it broke into several working groups. The the main ones of which are the conservation working group, which is this one, uh, and the Hamlet um, um, working group. Uh, there's also a, a group that, that was focused on uh, tax uh, abatement for large, uh, particularly especially large property um, owners, which did a great deal of good work um, last year and um, has now sort of um, we, um, pulled back a bit in the, into the background while we while we pursue the enabling legislation from the state. So this group is focused on the conservation side of things. And um, and what our and we early on we asked the question what what are the priority areas to protect um, after having a, a, a an even longer discussion by email which coincided with the beginning of COVID so everybody was at home and um, had time on their hands and was willing to participate and we had hundreds of emails flying back and forth on the topic of what 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 does rural character consist of. It was very illuminating, really, uh, that, that the uh, the characteristics of rural areas, I guess they would say, um, what different people valued, uh, and, and it's not just the uh, you know absence of houses. It was, it was the freedom of action was a big consideration. Um, so, um, but I think we sort of came around to realizing, no matter what you believe is important or think about uh, rural or, uh, character. Uh, it is a uh, it's it's dependent upon a, a low density of, of housing because as as the areas get built up they lose their rural character and become more suburban in nature regardless of what you um, you know whether you value what they turn into or not um, they're not uh, rural anymore so um, the the really difficult issue is the is the one of uh, development along the road. Uh, when we as a group asked the question of each other, uh, you know, what are, what do you, um, which areas of the town do you most value and why basically, um, we came back with a myriad of, of, uh, of commentary from people. And the, and, the, and the result was that if you put them all together, um, the entire town was covered so that there was we, we collectively value everything and, and it wasn't very helpful to come to that conclusion is trying to decide what are priority conservation areas. So um, scratching our heads a bit, um, we, um, I, I don't I remember whether it was Jason that suggested this or it just came out of the fact that there was some overlap in what people valued. The um, focus, initial focus of the group was on could we create a conservation overlay? Um, this is after Jason offered various tools that could be used for that purpose. And um, the conservation overlay was, was, was something that we gravitated to and started working on water as a sort of a theme that, that would enable us to look at important water resources. So repairing corridors and um, wetlands, 
And there's some talk of including uh, area aquifer uh, um, considerations where, where water availability is scarce so that we might um, have that be as a criterion for an overlay district that would, that would limit development on that basis. Um, that's kind of where we off, um, at the last meeting with that we were, uh, we got a little bit hung up on the apparent lack of clarity regarding what is an intermittent versus a, versus a perennial stream. Uh, and I think that was sort of resolved. Uh, there, there is a definitive um, uh, mapping. It just wasn't clear from what we were working with what what was what. And um, and with, and then we talked a little bit, but didn't really get that far into you know what kind of setbacks one would wish for, um, and whether that makes a difference whether in a rural area, you know, in the outlying parts of town where the, where there's not much built up, or in the hamlets where a lot of the housing traditionally and initially was built right along the creeks because the, uh, the water resource is an important source of power. So uh, let's see. So, so, so some of these things are all coming to a head because we had that nice walk. Um, we now appreciate um, the, the, the task, um, the difficult task of, of how do we address the development along the road, which is the which is where development is happening for a variety of reasons, um, most of which have to do with that's where the equity lies. It's the easiest area to develop. So if we're going to inhibit it in some way, um, the question is how, and now what? Um, so at the, um, that was a focus of the planning group meeting on January 5th, where uh, David went through uh, the pantheon of possible options for, uh, addressing that qu very question, what, what are our options for protecting open space? And um, I'm thinking, but I'd like some feedback from you all, um, that it, it uh, because it's where the most difficult issue lies, it doesn't make sense to tackle that pivotal issue um, as a starting place, or do we have to circle at it from, from a variety of directions. Because one option would be to, to um, identify important areas to conserve and then consider which tools are best suited to each one because it may not be the same for, each, for, what, for what's out there. Um, and the other approach would be to say, what are the tools available? And then, um, and then try to discern you know, which, where you would apply them. So it's, you know, coming out from slightly different directions. So I've spoken enough. Time for somebody else to say something. <laughs> Joel, we talked about putting up the, uh, the list that we ended the last meeting at. So I'm gonna go ahead and share that screen. Okay, good. Um, and in this list, you know, this isn't something that's been finalized or voted on, but when people said they liked something, I highlighted it. And when people voiced a concern about something, I crossed it out. Um, so this, this is a way to start thinking about some of the tools that we have available. Um, and do you have the option of making it a little bit bigger or should I put my glasses on? <laughs> let's see. Yeah, that's better. Except that it doesn't. Oh, something's buried under the earth. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. How's that? Good. Um, hmm. I think that's as big as I can get it. Okay, that's that's fine. I don't remember the first cross out, but, um, and I wonder whether it's wise to have, have it be there, but. Can you remind us what that is? With the restrictive zoning? So that was use restrictive zoning, uh, meaning a zone that might not allow housing at all. Oh.
and people felt like that was a bit extreme. Yeah, if there wasn't, if it, if it, if it was, it was not allowed at all, that would be. Uh, I could see what that was. Re I, I remember that reaction now that you um, express it. It's always good to find a bracket of what is too far. Yeah, we can all agree that's too far. Well, I don't I agree, agree that's too far. I can see I not everybody that. agrees as Rhonda. But, um, <laughs> as I recall, you were, you were quite vocal in, in thinking that that was a perfectly appropriate thing to do. Right. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you have, and, but there's another way of doing that, and it's through a conservation easement. Yeah. Um, but the thing about the conservation easement, I mean, there, there are broadly two kinds of approaches, um, voluntary approaches and regulatory approaches. And the conservation easement is a voluntary approach. And in order for it to work, you have to have people willing to participate uh, either by donating their, their development rights or if the community thought that the, what resources that they happen to own are, are sufficiently valuable, um, purchasing them. And um, so they don't work if you, they don't work for, for protecting areas where people don't want to give up the development rights either. So how do you justify a stream and wetland buffer protection like is on the bottom section, yet you're, you're saying, well, if somebody has a forest that isn't along a stream, then we aren't going to protect it. I think it's a matter of scale. Um, you're unlikely to preclude a, a particular property owner from doing anything on their property with um, with a riparian corridor, uh, although it could happen. I mean, certainly if you had, um, to take an example, you know, there, a lot of the hamlet is close to the streams. And if we if we were to impose the same buffer requirement, um, um, you know, going forward as in, in the hamlets as we did, if we as we do in the outlying parts of the town, there's a lot of properties that are currently developed with houses on them that would be undevelopable um, because of the proximity to the streams. Well, let's look at it this way. I was told that when my house was built, the health department, the county health department determined where the house was to be. That in, in effect, the, the health department said, you cannot, to the person who built the house, you cannot build this house anywhere else. That's interesting. So I don't see why you should feel that somehow the town saying the same thing to somebody is inappropriate. You know, it all depends on the lay of the land, what's there uh, in, in environmental, uh, from an environmental perspective, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, well, except that was 40 years ago and we don't know what all of the reasoning was there. Oh, so we do know the reasoning. The reasoning was that there was a creek running right through the backyard. Okay. And they wanted so, to make sure that there was a certain um, distance between the house and the septic and the house and the well and the house and the creek and all of these things and determined that the only place where the house could be was in this one spot. I'm, I'm guessing that the creek may not have figured into that equation, but the, but the requirements of the separation between the well and the septic and the, and the available places where the septic could go determine where the house could be. Because I don't think the health department has any authority to dictate where the house is going to be. Right, on a small lot that size, there's only so many places you can fit the separation required. Yeah, so it's kind of constraint, but I, I doubt that the creek was a consideration. So I have a question. I, I guess I missed this meeting. Um, the purchase of development rights and the transfer of development rights, that's also crossed out. Um, how did we get to that point? Well, with regard to the purchase of development rights, it, it mostly had to do with the, the uh, to do it, one would have to have um, the political will to raise the money to buy them. And the judgment of the group was that we don't have that in Danby. Uh, and the transfer of development rights, um, the issue there was the, um, you have to have 
a, a, doning, a donating area and a receiving area. And the receiving area has to be um, a sufficiently desirable place to develop that a developer would benefit from buying the rights from the don donating area um, in order to transfer them into that area. And countywide, we might have at this point that that might be the case with the city and some of the countryside, but within the town of Danby, um, it's highly, un it, 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 we don't have that situation at all. I mean, it's not that the, quite the opposite. In fact, the, um, it, the, it, can, it can be argued and has been by developers is that the hamlets are less desirable than the outlying areas um, because of, you know, the older houses, housing and de somewhat deteriorated housing, and there not being much of anything there that would attract um, residents. I, I figured it's a poor investment compared to the kind of greenfield development that we've been getting. So, um, so for those reasons, you know, th th both of those were rather dim prospects. Um, it's also, I think, I think David pointed out uh, when asked that um, transfer development rights hasn't been done anywhere in New York State, has it? I think it has, but it's very difficult in New York State because um, you don't have regional planning. So I, I do think there are some communities that do it. Um, and generally when that happens, you get uh, an intermunicipal inter agreement where um, you know some of the taxes that are lost from the sending municipality um, get transferred back by the receiving municipality uh, because essentially you're you're reducing the value of property in one place and increasing the value of property in the other place. Um, but it's very complicated where we have home rule. It's more common in other states where you might have uh, a county-wide planning um, system. Um, in New York State, with each community being separate, you have to have a lot of agreement between the different communities in the area. Of the, I wouldn't totally preclude it. It's not impossible. It's a. It would be a big uphill, long-term thing. It would be fantastic. Um, I think it's a great idea. It's just not something that um, DMB can do alone. It's something that you know it, it could conceivably work on a countywide basis. Yeah. Hey, hey, Joel. I was away for a few minutes, but the large lot zoning. I wanted to make a point. That walk was precipitated in a meeting I raised. I said, listen, if you want to see what large lot zoning is going to get you, I saw it down Cram <clears throat> excuse me, Cranberry, New Jersey, which <clears throat> had a lot of the same principles behind its zoning as ours, and they made large lot zoning. <clears throat> so you have these huge homes on huge lots with a lot of fun, which really, I said, the indicative spot to me was Nelson Road. You're getting these houses blop, blop, blop all over the place on these huge lots. And it's like, is that really what we want Danby to look like? And that that's what really got that whole walk going was that comment. And um, I forget, somebody suggested doing a walk out there and seeing it. And that, it yeah, it yeah. might have been Leslie who, who came up with that idea. How big were the lots in the in, in, in Granberry. It was five acre and it's just ugly as hell. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I think David observed that the only place this works is when the large lots are really large lots, which is on the order of 20 acres or more. Because uh, then you're, you know, they're big enough that you're not, you're not, you're not causing the same kind of sprawl. But you still have the, the concern that you voiced though. Um, I, I think there's a community outside of Albany um, that did that in an effort to preserve their open space. And what they turned themselves into is a, is, is a wealthy and exclusive suburb um, mm. where, you know, because the lots are 40 acres or whatever they are, you know, they all, all they've got is a mansion district. Yeah, yeah. But we could, so we could easily, well, even, even if we adopted it on a more modest scale in Danby, um, it would make the rural properties more expensive to acquire because they'd have, they would be bigger. Uh, and the probability is that the houses that would be built would be, you know, fairly upscale. Um, so unless we counterbalance that, if you say, well, it's really important to keep that land open, um, unless we counterbalance that with some increased opportunities for building housing in and near the hamlets, 
um, you're going to be making it a, a, a more, more and more upscale community and, and pricing those of us who are not upscale out of our own town. Um, yeah. Well, I agree. I'm not, I'm not for the large lot zoning. I just wanted to raise that, you know, maybe we could do something with like a, uh, a either a, a form of a TDR or something like that, that gave a person who wanted to develop a, some advantages like, okay, this is one acre lot. We'll let you put some higher density, even higher than one acre. If you preserve X number of acres elsewhere and do some trade-offs like that, that would, that would maybe get more of your cluster housing in the center of town or elsewhere. Um, right. That and that may be something to do, something like that. Thinking well, that was certainly discussed. David, can you remind us which of your examples that, that, that would have fallen into? Because I certainly remember. Well, that, that about, yeah, the so conservation that. subdivision um, is the one that the first of the yellow <laughs> Lots. Uh, while we're, while we're, I don't know how easy it would be, David, for you to show us the more detailed slide when we're talking about. Sure, I can do that. You might have to zoom. Quite, quite have to scroll nicely, through and find it, but yeah. yeah. Advantages and disadvantages of each of them. While, while he's doing that, could I just say that one of the things that I think makes people have these opinions about large lots and their appearance is that much of the acreage of Danby is fields. And so when you see a house in the middle of a field, it's completely different when you see the same size lot that's in the woods. Absolutely. So, so I think appearance is part of what we're, I mean, it may have, that all those other issues may play right along, but appearance is, is if we're talking about appearance, we've got to remember that everything isn't fields. Right. Well, I think that there's, a, <clears throat> you may not have traveled enough in the Finger Lakes, but there's a spot out um, beyond, well, it's in Yates County, beyond Penyan, when you're going out to Canandaigua Lake. And it's, it is all field out there. It's not corn, it's uh, some sort of grain. And it's, you get to a rise in the road and you can see at least a thousand acres in this whole circular um, sort of horizontal view. And there are only three houses in that entire view and they are not together. They are parceled way out, you know, in in the field and it's actually beautiful. Um, I don't think that, and they're not big houses or anything like that. I mean, Yates County is not into big houses and at least most of it. And uh, I, I think it all depends on the situation. And certainly in that part of Yates County, they're very interested, and also in Ontario County, very interested in having large single houses on large parcels. So it's it, it all depends on your perspective, I think. It but I think the original, the, the original question was, how should we proceed from where we were with Jason? And we had been sitting down with Jason looking at the creeks and waterways and we never finished that and I would like to get on with that. I want to do what we what we want to protect. That was the whole point. What is it we want to protect and we need to identify those things and then continue on from there. Well that's certainly one option because that's where as you say where, where we were and I don't think we should set that down. Um, but it's also, um, but it's also only part of the picture because the the, the, the larger issue, um, you know, it, it extends beyond the, the the riparian corridors. Well, of course, but we do need to identify them, and we should. It's something easy for us to do. We can protect the riparian corridors right from the get go. Identify them, set limits on the setbacks and 
uh, and that then that's done. It's something that we can actually say we've done. We can't actually claim to have done anything, even though we've been working on this now for a year. True enough. Um, where um, Jason had at the, at the last meeting where we talked about this um, maps of the uh, of the stream class. And uh, and we were, and we had a, a start of a discussion about the what the setbacks could and should be, and uh, I don't recall exactly how that went, except there was some question about you know what are others doing and how much of a setback, and 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 somebody observed that you know we don't have to reinvent the wheel because this has been dealt with elsewhere. Uh, have we had that discussion or zoning at present? No. Um, at the at the moment, there's nothing in it that that, that specifically uh, addresses the uh, streams. Wetlands we are have, addressed. We do have setbacks in the subdivision. So when if someone does a subdivision that's a standard subdivision, there are conservation requirements that um, impact uh, buffer. Uh, but it only applies if someone does a, a standard subdivision. So if you do one lot at a time, it's not going to apply. Yeah, and we haven't had, so, well, yeah. So we were looking at the different streams and we did notice that there were some um, flaws in his maps. There were streams that he was naming as year round that were really intermittent. If I remember from that, that was many months ago. Yes, I remember. That. I remember the issue it was a question. You know, is it um, that what some of them were marked intermittent? Were some of them that were marked year-round? We, um, we thought were intermittent. Uh, I don't remember whether it went the other way or not. But um, well, the creek in my backyard was was originally well, and probably still is. Uh, listed by the DEC as intermittent. And when I contacted, uh, I don't know if it was Gene Foley or somebody else and asked about that, they said, oh, that doesn't mean that it doesn't run all the time. That's just our way of saying that it isn't a big creek. And uh, well, in my, <laughs> I'm at the beginning, the headwaters of the creek, so it's not going to be a big creek, but it's definitely year round. And, and the fact that it was listed as intermittent didn't seem to bother them. So I, I don't think that we should worry about whether it's intermittent or not intermittent. Or perennial. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to worry about uh, the, finding, figuring out the center of the creek and determining how far back from that we're going to allow people to build. And I remember we were talking about, well, should it be 100 feet or should it be 150? I and think it was 50 is what it, the current thing is. No. We weren't talking numbers that big, Rhonda. Because my house is 100 feet from the creek, is yeah. exactly 100 feet from the creek. But I do remember the discussion because intermittency does matter. Um, there, there, you know, there are a lot of, of seasonal, um, you know, drainages that that dry up uh, in the summertime. And if you if you had to be the same setbacks on 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 those as on something that, that runs year round, um, there would be a lot more uh, area that would be uh, restricted from development than than right. if you go with with, with the perennial. Right. And see, the whole thing with the creek, let's go to the whole reason behind it, is to keep sediment and sedimentation out of the creek from going downstream and filling up either wetlands or, you know, ponds and, and lakes and things like that. That's, that's why we're having the setback, so that there won't be sediment running into those creeks. Well, it's sediment. That's plus, the purpose. Plus. Uh, other people here have different purposes. I'm sorry. Rhonda wants nobody else living in this town and zero development. And you got to understand that that's the filter. She's been kind of nasty on Facebook the last week to support <laughs> it in town, to say the least. Okay. Uh, other people here have seen what she said. And it's been downright nasty. And I'm sorry, Rhonda, I'm calling you out because, you know, you really. You really no, lose, you, you lose your voice when you do that in a public arena and then try to control us here. I'm not. I'm right on. 
you're saying this because you are you are actually cultivating right next to the Danby Creek. You are cultivating with very close to the Danby Creek. And if we put down any setback, you're going to be negatively affected by that. I, I think we can refocus. I accepted, my dear. I think we can refocus the conversation to where we're going with this work instead of. Um, yeah, I don't think that's very, it, it, it's a bit, it's off topic at best. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, I think Joel was, was right on track talking about the, the ways we can think about a stream uh, setback law and the, the way that DC has classified streams and the county has classified streams can be really useful. It's what the town of Ithaca uses. They use the intermittent and perennial, uh, perennial stream classification and they use the 50 and 100 foot buffers that are recommended by the county. Um, so and it's a one, one for the inter, sorry, David, one for the intermittent and the other for the I mean, a smaller setback for intermittent. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. So I, I'm actually going to switch the screen that I'm sharing um, and show you. I dropped in the chat um, a link to the Tompkins County Natural Resource Inventory. Um, and that's an online tool that has, uh, you can turn on stream buffers for oh, yeah, 100 right feet there. from perennial streams and 50 feet from intermittent streams. Um, am I sharing the screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so the problem is that when you have some of these big June rainstorms that we've been getting now because of the change in, in the climate, um, you know, even these little intermittent streams, all of a sudden they're overflowing their banks and everything. I mean, I've been having a terrible time with that. And at one point, uh, my whole property turned into a lake. So, you know, I think we should be erring on the side of caution and not on, well, 50 feet. 50 feet becomes very small when the water is flowing. Well, it depends on the topography, but, you know. I mean, I, I remember in uh, 2015 when we had the Danby flood uh, that, you know, every every ditch became a creek, every creek became a river, um, you know, that uh, in every culvert was overflowing, you know, was over over top because there wasn't, there wasn't enough capacity in anything. Um, and, but you, but you can't, I mean, you can't plan for that, for that kind of um, scenario. Um, Might have to, but. Um, not yet, maybe. Well, yeah, but again, topography matters because if, if 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 the creek is on the, you know, if 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 the housing or, or potential housing is on, you know, adjoins a, a the creek where you're, where you're practically in a flat area where it's floodplain, like, um, you know, when the creek runs over, out, out its bankings, it can affect a large area. Whereas if it's a more, um, you know, if it's if if the banks are steeper, you can have you can accommodate a lot more water without without expanding the footprint much. I think one of the things we have to be careful about is setting a house in such a way that it isn't it, the house, is not affected by an overflow of, of the creek, whatever creek that might be, to such an extent that we then have people who have damage to their homes and then our, our I mean that collectively, our uh, home owner's insurance goes up because of that. Uh, I definitely remember doing closings of people who um, were in listed flood zones and the, ki the kind of insurance that they were paying was just, I, I don't know how they could afford their houses with that kind of insurance. So we wanna make sure that we site the houses in such a way that they don't ever get affected by flooding. People like to live near water, though. Um, if That's you, not an uh, I'm sure you're. I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the famous um, Frank Lloyd Wright house, house called Falling Water. Yes. But, um, you know, if, if, if the kind of rules that we're talking about here would, would preclude anything like that from ever being constructed. Well, I, you know, we could. You go to the BZA, right? If you have something special but we need to be careful that we protect everybody else from an increase in insurance rates. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the flood hazard is a good is a good um, additional consideration when deciding about um, you know discouraging housing. Um, and I don't remember that we took that that's been brought to the to the table as of yet um, as, as an additional consideration. Maybe it's a hundred year, so, year flood zone on the map. I'm not I'm not hearing you clear. So David has put the hundred year flood zone on the map. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think I want to make sure that we're we're focusing on what these different tools are for. And the stream setbacks rule isn't for preventing um, flooding. flooding. It's not for preventing impacts from the stream on the house. It's for protecting uh, the stream from uh, runoff and uh, impacts of having building an impervious, impervious surface in the area adjacent to the stream. So I don't want us to get um, focused in the wrong way about what these tools are for. Um, it's also important to remember that zoning, you know, we're looking at the whole town. It's, it's not going to always be perfect in each individual instance. It can't be. There's no way that we can set a rule that's going to um, perfectly protect every single parcel or every single uh, particular circumstance. Um, no, we're really looking at the aggregate effect of, of a, a kind of blunt instrument tool here. Yeah. And um, and you do you do as well as you can, and then you deal with the exceptions with the PZA. <laughs> yeah. So um, what, I, it's pretty hard to tell here from what what we're actually looking at. Um, oh, yeah, Leslie's got her hand up. <laughs> oh, and it's hard for me to tell who's got their hand up when we only have a partial <laughs> screen, but everybody you know on the I'm side. No, I don't. I I may be getting off topic. But are, are we only talking about waterways right now? I mean, I'm, I, I, keep, I keep sort of going back to the enhanced environmental review slash site plan review. I mean, for, for a lot of the things that people are talking about, siting of houses, um, wh where the house is in the lot. Um, mm -hmm. you no, know, I, I don't know. I, I keep, that's, that's sort of coming coming around to being my favorite tool. <laughs> I don't, and, and I don't know if it could help with a lot of these other issues, including water and... Um... Well, that was kind of what I was um, asking in the, um, before Rhonda suggested that we started on uh, repairing corridors and looking at water. Um, and we ought, to, we ought to focus on that and, and, and finish that before we, we tackle the other. I'm, I'm not convinced of that necessarily the case, but, but we are... Um, at least focusing on it a little bit right now to see whether we, we maybe that's what we, we want to do or we can get that still moving along without having to um, set it aside because we were, we did sort of, you know, start on that task, um, looking at repairing cars as sort of a connector and wetlands um, and maybe, but we hadn't really talked about how we would do it, the uh, aquifer oh, protection. The aquifer protection, I mean, is, I mean, do we want to talk about that or people have people read that again or um I well mean, that's that... the question i mean you know the, the, i i had i certainly wondered whether or not we had adequate data to be able to um, designate um you know an area of town where we could use that as a criterion for for creating an area saying you know in this area water availability is really limited and consequently um you know we we are we're, we are um, limiting the housing of certain density uh, in that in that area. I'm not sure that we have a, a, a solid knowledge base to do that with. Well, we have. I mean, there there was data, and, and I know that some people would argue that it, it wasn't good enough, or he didn't show somebody something because they asked for it. But there there is data that was a study that was something you know, that was paid for, it's a big body of work. And that was where that was supposed to go as far as, you know, in the future that we'd be able to say, okay, there, there's these five wells up here. They're having trouble with those wells. Um, we really can't have any more houses or we gotta limit the number of houses. There's more water over here. I, and, and 
at the end of that study, it was it, there. The town should have taken on collecting more data, collecting more well information. Um, so maybe that's something we need to um, get a program in place to do that. I think um, that I we can think talk about pretty... not having data, or we could do something about it. <laughs> yeah. I think that we do get. Uh, it, it, it's now the case that whenever anybody drills a well, um, the basic information about it is filed at the DEC, uh, and we have access to that. Uh, okay. But um, and we should be what we didn't have was very good data on the older wells, uh, and we've got anecdotal data. You know, and and and, and Steve Winkley, um, you know, pulled together what he could get his hands on. But it was a kind of an incomplete picture. And there were a lot of people that filled out those surveys. Yeah. Joel, I'm not, I'm not sure you would have more than the well depth and what the gallons per minute being extracted yeah. in the ground is uh, right. for that particular well. <laughs> it will not show whether the well goes dry in the summer. And, and, and I raised this as a big concern months ago. And I think we ought to try to restrict and you know, the areas where people's wells are going dry. I mean, down in the valley where we're at, we tend not to have a problem with a dry well at all. Um, although I don't think that we really want to be moving development to down in the valley either because of the aquifer. But um, up on the hillsides, like you go up Gunderman, get up top there, it's really tough. Or you get over Hornbrook. Hornbrook, it's it's really tough. We know people have wells and they're down hundreds and hundreds of feet and they're having trouble. Or up on Yaple, we have friends who their well does a half a gallon of water per minute and they have a holding tank so they can have enough water to um, take care of their family needs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Russ, I just want to ask Russ a question. Do you sure. happen to have a uh, one of those uh, radios a local radio that you can hear the fire department on? I do not. Okay. Do. Anybody on here have one? Have Four fire one. engines have gone by my house just now. Well, so I heard the fire horn go off about 10 minutes ago. We, we have the right, we have the police scanner on now. We haven't heard any information. Okay. okay. Well, the fire, fire truck drove by my truck, my house moments ago. Well, on, on its way over to Danby. So it must have been a mutual aid call. Yeah. yeah. Well, the uh, sirens have been going off. We could hear them inside town hall. Janice yeah. came in, like, what is that? Uh, the problem is that if, if the Danby State Forest catches on fire, we're in trouble. Well, yeah, not this time of the year. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised with all of the dead ashes. Why not? <laughs> so I, I'd like to propose a, a way of moving forward. It seems like we have different people who have different interests and things that they'd like to see going forward. Um, we could divide the groups. Is you suggesting? Yeah. Well, the the point of having a working group like this is to um, kind of make assignments and go do work, and then come back and and discuss it. Yeah. Um, so we we could have people um, decide to have some smaller groups take on some of the pieces here that um, uh, piqued the interest of the group, and uh, maybe we could make sure that the the whole group doesn't think that tackling something would be a waste of time if nobody else agrees with it. But if we could break into uh, a few people in a group and um, go away for the next you know, few weeks and um, look at, learn a little more about these tools or uh, the data behind um, any of the, the options that people wanna see and then have a plan to come back and move forward from there. I think that might be a useful uh, way to spend our time. I, I like the idea of, you know, particularly since we have um, some people who feel really strongly about the need to advance the work that's already been begun with respect to uh, water resources and, and, uh, and you know, and, and, and using that as a, as a basis for an overlay zone and, and what might, what kind of restrictions might be associated with it, um, that, that it, it certainly would make a good working subcommittee to, to deal with that specifically. Um, so uh... the one thing that I would like to point out, you know, I, I definitely agree with Leslie that we should be careful about allowing people to build in areas where the water is a bit iffy. But the thing is, I'm not sure that would hold up in court, because when I talked to Steve Winkley, 
I asked him if there was any way that I personally could determine what aquifer I was tapped into because I wanted to know if I was connected to Jennifer Tiffany or to my neighbors in the back or what. And he said, no, there was no way that you could tell. And so if, if there is no way that you can tell what aquifer you're tapped into, then it would be hard, I would think, for a town to legally say, well, other people in this area where you want to build are having trouble with their water, does, does that equate, does it equate to say then that another person building in that area would also have trouble with their water? I, I'm not sure that it or does. There, or even if they didn't have problems that it wouldn't create problems for you. Right. right. So I, I think that's a really great point, Rhonda. And it, it brings me back to a conversation I had with Guy, the town's attorney recently. Um, and he said, um, you know, I'm still learning all the things that have happened in the past that the town's tried or talked about. Um, and one thing that I know was discussed with him in the past and that he did shoot down for legal reasons was um, a way of permitting the amount of water that someone can um, bring up. And mm -hmm. uh, that was definitely a no-no. You can't do that. Um, but he did say that the town of Caroline's um, regulations that they have with regard to uh, development and um, aquifers do stand up. Um, so that would be a place that, you know, a group could look at and maybe find some other examples as well um, and formulate something that could be useful for Danby and, and bring it back at, at the next meeting for people to think about and review. Mm -hmm. Well, I could always call Caroline and ask them for a copy of it. Yeah. We can get it without we can get it without having to call him, Daniel, can't we? Yeah, Guy's the attorney for Caroline as well, so that's why he knew that theirs was reasonable and our plan. Dave, what, what what is it? What what's the title of what you're talking about? I'm not exactly sure. Oh, okay. I can't check to see if I have it. Yeah. Well, I mean, we certainly get it. And, uh, you know, we have a good working relationship with Caroline. So I'm sure that they'd be happy to share whatever they've done. You know. Yep. So maybe it would make sense um, as we're getting up on the end of an hour um, to, to think about these uh, different tools. And um, I left it open at the end of the last meeting. You know, these are the tools that came to mind for me, but there may be other tools mm -hmm. that people want to look into. Um, but it definitely sounds like there is some energy around looking at um, streams. I, I would say we should look at streams and aquifers as two separate things. Mm -hmm. um, they're dealt with differently, but um, maybe we can have some volunteers for who would be interested in looking at streams. Um, and I'd highly recommend um, starting with the town of Ithaca as a good example. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that linked them was water. <laughs> it, yeah. But how you deal with them, as you say, so, you know, the tools are a What are different. you proposing be done? Your statement was rather vague, David. Uh, I'm proposing that uh, a few people who are here volunteer to um, do some study on uh, stream protection and bring back options or an option, I think it's always best to have more than one, but bring back some ideas to this group um, when we meet again in February. Well, I could contact the zoning person, the zoning officers in, we're talking the town of Ithaca, in the town of Ithaca and ask them what they've come up with. Yeah, they, they have a great ordinance. You can just download it from their website as well. They they have their whole code on E360. Um, yeah, I think that the starting place would be to look at what you've got and then and then if there are questions, then then go to the officials and ask them the questions, um, yeah. you know, informed by having looked at the documents first. Uh, I think Ulysses has setbacks also. Ulysses does, and I think they actually use the town of Ithaca as a template. Oh, is that right? Well, so then. Hmm. So it, uh, do, we, do we have people who are, want to specifically volunteer to be part of that group? 
And my suggestion would be, we get a couple people, they do some research. You can talk back and forth with me. I can direct you to resources. And then we, we're not expecting anything done next month, but just a report back about what did you learn? What are the things that seem the most useful for the town of DMB? I'll, yeah, I can I'll, do it. I'll look into some stuff. Mayor Rhonda could take Ithaca and I could take Caroline Ulysses or something. Okay, I saw Rhonda, uh, uh, Leslie and Toby. You're on mute if you were trying to say something. Um, and <laughs> Catherine, did you say no, you wanted to No, I'm not to trying to say anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, every time we get into any conversation like this, it, it comes back to one of the other main groups from the working group, I mean, from the planning group, and that's uh, public outreach, because I, I still think that a huge amount of what we're talking about, I couldn't research all this stuff very well, and I might not, like, looking at the maps, it's, I don't know enough, but what I hear and the combinations of things is back to having a purpose for these groups so that we can educate the public because we can't re regulate everything, but we can try to repeatedly, repeatedly teach. Um, and actually the community council would probably be willing to put on some program too. I mean, there's, we had Steve come and he did those programs and it was very interesting and it happened once and I've forgotten most of it. But if we keep doing this, we keep having new people coming in to town and education or helping people understand is what I think is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe even definite, maybe even coming up with a list of, of terms and then have fairly specific, not, not too long, but fairly specific definitions and publish those. So like, for instance, riparian ways, just words and, and terms and put them in. And so I would be interested in if there's any way to participate in that, I'm sort of interested in the public education. I learn and I don't, and I've changed my ways. And I don't think everybody's stubborn. I mean, I'm pretty stubborn, but I'm willing to change. <laughs> you know, the, uh, what, what you're suggesting, Catherine, is really what, what we were hoping the, uh, the uh, outreach group would be doing. Right. Well, I was in that and we didn't, I didn't, we, we got off on it. We just sort of. Well, yeah. And, and part of the reason was, we're, we're, was we didn't have, uh, we didn't have anything to share yet, you know, because the work needs to be done in order to, sh to, to share about it. But. Um, well, we can go back and simply share those, the, the beginnings of the videos that um, Jason did, or maybe even use one of um, uh, Kevin's flyovers i mean anything to get people interested uh you know they don't have to be important they don't have to have lessons in them they don't have to have it's just you know people get in their cars and they drive to wherever it is and that's it mm -hmm. so anyway that's my little spiel thanks Catherine. i think that's a great point i'm, I'm glad you're volunteering to be involved with the education <laughs> and outreach component <laughs> so I, I like it. I like education. Isn't something supposed to be going into um, the next Dan Dan B area news about about the planning group and the, getting people involved? I don't know who was going to write that, but I thought that was happening. Well, I mean, I I, I just might have already forgotten what I wrote, but um, but I but I try to do a, a regular update on anything that, that I think might be of interest to people that help the. You know, I, thought of, that, I thought we were going to have a separate article on that that wasn't wasn't hidden in the. Um, if so, I don't recall who was charged with writing it. How about you, Joel? <laughs> well, I, mean, <laughs> well that, I think I think Catherine had a great point that you know these things can be taken in little bites. Yes. Um, yeah. And yeah. you know, having there's a lot of ways that that can be done. You could um, put just make sure that there's something, a link to a video or, or a little article um, once a month. Um, that's something citizens can do too. You can bring that to, uh, to the public comment period, um, three minutes for the town board to give them the little bit of the education that you want and them to have and you know, for all the people who see it too. 
Um, I think that's a great thing to think about. And our town board meetings are way too short, so it would be a great addition. You got three minutes. You can teach whatever you want. <laughs> um, so we've got Rhonda, Leslie, and Toby for stream protection ordinance. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I know there's a, a separate conversation about um, looking at aquifer issues. Yeah, so this is a separate conversation. And we hadn't organized ourselves around that at all, except to identify it as a potentially connected um, concern. Mm -hmm. Water, um, yeah, but it but it might, as you suggest, um, have a totally different approach to dealing with it. Don't we have some maps already for oh, the, the aquifers? The stuff that Miller did. I mean, well, we do have the aquifers, but the but the, the they're the uh, the uh, they're not the uh, they're not the well the, they're the aquifers. They're, they don't include the areas where there isn't any real aquifer. You know, the up up uphill areas where the groundwater is mostly found in the bedrock. Um, what, what was, what was uh, mapped was the, was the, you know, water bearing um, um, strata in the valleys. Because um, um, the Danby Valley hadn't been done. And it, and it, and it, and it determined you know, where, where the aquifer was, how, how thick it was, how far down it is, whether it's confined or not. Where it recharges. Yeah, where it recharges, um, whether it's confined or not. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of good information that gives us a better idea of what our development constraints are, because we didn't have any idea before um, in the Danby Hamlet. Um, and then, but, but then outside of the potential development in the valley is the, is the concern about what about if water availability when you get uphill. Um, and, and most of our problem areas are, in fact, on the upland regions where there's no real aquifer there. The water you get out is usually, if you go down far and you can find, a, find a, a vein in the bedrock someplace where the water connects, and then you can pull it out that way. But um, Is there some kind of relationship between the stormwater laws and the aquifer? That, that probably was a question for David. Um, there could be. I, I think there are, you know, generally fairly uh, different issues that we're dealing with. Um, so do we need to make another topic called stormwater? I, mean, I think stormwater is the one that the town deals with the best already. Um, yeah, because that was already, the, the regulatory framework is in place and and the yeah. objective is clear because it's mostly trying to, to uh, restrain runoff um, to limit um, sedimentation and scouring. Yeah, I think Danby probably has the strongest stormwater law in the county as it is. Oh, that that's nice. <laughs> um, so how about this aquifer question? Are there people who feel hot to trot about this and want to put some time into looking into um, ideas? Well, I mean, here's, here's a question is, is are, are, um, are the areas where water availability is, is um, marginal uh, among the areas most, the most uh, uh, of concern as far as conserving open space? And if the answer is yes, is this is an important tool um, to, that might be employed in order to help, um, you know, limit development density. Because um, we're not, um, who, I don't know, who was it observed? Um, was it you, David? That, that guy thought that uh, might have been Rhonda, that the um, trying to limit the density on the basis of uh, water availability um, was a, was was not a very solid foundation. It was the specific way that the previous proposal was made um, that he had an issue with, which I'm not familiar with. Um, yeah, I know that when we've had you know development, um, you know subdivision um, proposals. 
um, that 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 water is has frequently come up as a concern, um, mm -hmm. frequently by neighbors in areas where where availability is is marginal, and um, and it has resulted in 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 in, in, in quite a few instances in in um, um, you know test wells and and drawdown studies. Um, that looked at you know what the whether neighboring wells could be were were affected by pumping the the new you know well and um, and, and as I recall um, Steve Winkley uh, might might I think it was Steve observed that or it might have been one of the engineers in one of these one of these studies that the, the cone of influence um, for any well is limited and uh, I think Steve was of the opinion that when you go above about uh, an acre and a half, it's really hard to show an impact on adjoining properties. Um, and an acre and a half is not going to be a development constraint in a low density zone. Well, I think one of the things that what happened to me was that I have really good, I have good and plentiful water. And all of a sudden there was this house going up behind me and I called Sue Beaners and I said what's going on <laughs> you know uh you know this is news to me that this house is going up and they're out there drilling a well and I was really concerned that it was going to impact my flow or the quality of the water and she of course said that she didn't need to notify me that somebody was going to be building right out my bathroom window. And uh, uh, there didn't seem to be anything that I could do about it as the fact that it was a modular house and the, a day later it was up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they started to get water from Shemung spring water, have it trucked in. And I was getting very suspicious. I was getting nervous. It was re really making me nervous about what was going on. But it seemed like I, as the person who was already there, had very little control over these people drilling a well and maybe tapping into my source and maybe decreasing or contaminating my source I felt I had absolutely no power. And we've discussed this in the past. Uh, there was a woman I knew who used to live on 96B, right near Curtis Road. And she said to me one time, well, we had great water until those people right there put in their house. And then I had nothing. And I think that's a major concern. And I think that we need to deal with it in some way. And I don't know how you do that. I don't know if you require them to put in their well first and to do some sort of testing uh, before they build the house. But many cases I see that it seems to me that the house is going up way before the well is even dug. Yeah, so, the, 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 and the part of the problem is that, you know, in, in New York State, to my understanding, um, the, the, the regulatory framework with regard to groundwater is, is it's called the law of capture. Um, you're pretty much you're pretty much free to do on your property uh, the access that you can pull off. And if it affects your neighbor, um, it's your neighbor's problem to deal with and not yours. And that's, that is problematic. Um, the only thing that I remember uh, when I discussed stuff like this with Guy him saying that if you can prove that someone has something that someone has done has decreased the value of your house, you can sue them after you've sold the house and incurred this decrease in the value of your house. So in other words, if someone uh, decreases or contaminates your water and it makes it harder for you to sell your house and you can actually prove that in a court of law, 
then you can sue them. But if you can't prove it in a court of law, you're just out of luck. And I, I think that's really cruel. I, I really do. I, we've got to deal with that in some way. Well, I yeah. do, but I mean, but we have to, we have the legal context. We have to, you know, we have to deal within the legal context of what we have in New York State, and and, and that can't always prove what I mean. Unless you want to spend a lot of money, you could probably, you can probably figure out whether somebody contaminated your well with some tests that are done. But other, I mean, we we <laughs> we had a well go belly up. We had to put in a new whole new well. We didn't know whether it was. The thumper trucks that were going around at the time. I remember those. Uh, yeah. The neighbor across the street uh, built a huge pond, um, and the people below their crops. So, you know, I, maybe it wasn't any of those things, but so we had to fork over. It's a shale based aquifer, yeah. and shale based aquifers are notoriously spotty and, right. and, uh, have all it sorts of intermittent problems. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, you really can't tell what what is the cause or effect. Right. Um, but uh, to get back to something that we can actually do something with, um, the the town of Caroline, I did some yeah. looking while we were chatting, and it's their subdivision ordinance um, yeah. that has a whole section on um, ways that you can, you know, try to be proactive. Again, you know. We can do our best and you can't guarantee that someone's well is gonna be good forever. You can't guarantee that there's no impact, um, but there are things that can be done during the subdivision process to study and test the availability of water and try to ensure um, that any new draw isn't going to adversely impact people. But this, this, um, this subdivision uh, ordinance probably only applies to realty subdivisions, right? Which is to say, you know, Five with it five lots or more? Uh, I'm not sure. Caroline's um, interesting because they don't have zoning, so they right. put everything through um, review outside of zoning. Right. See, subdivision subject to. Yeah. <laughs> so they go. apply um, their subdivision ordinance to all development of land, which um, is not which is not an exempt subdivision. Yeah. And I think I think um, what what's meant by exempt subdivision? What subdivisions are exempt? It's the uh, it's the right very here. first. It's right above that. Exempt subdivisions, lot line adjustments, rural land division, uh, small scale residential. Yeah. Small scale subdivision that we lots. usually deal with. with Up to five people. lots, right? So it, it's a. Uh, it, it doesn't kick in into more than five lots. No, it says five acres. No, oh, five lots along five lots. <laughs> of less than five acres. Okay. Um, but that within a three year period part is also. Yes, uh, also relevant. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we have to go with what Caroline has. We could make it more strict. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think that's, and, that's kind of the point of this process is to. Uh, Find examples. Um, and and the problem about, with this is that it only uh, it doesn't catch what we've been, what we're getting, or what, we're, what they're getting either. You know, lot by lot, one lot at a time. Yep. So I I think that's that's something that it would be useful to have some people take a look at over the next couple of weeks, um, and then make some recommendations back to the group of how. Um, if there is a way to proceed forward, or if this is a dead end and we want to look at other things. Uh, does does Whitehawk uh, share wells or do they all, does each house up there have its own well? I believe they do share wells, um, but I think that they've got them, you know, like up to three residences or something on a well, because more than three becomes a public water system and then it triggers all kinds of regulatory um, oversight that they don't want to get into. So if they're going to put in 30 houses, they're going to have 10 wells, Doug? I th that's a prop, something like that, yeah. Wow. How do they know they're not going to be tapping all, all of them into the same aquifer? 
they might well be doing it. And it doesn't really, uh, the, the, the public health law doesn't care whether they're tapping into the same aquifer or not. It just means that they just, all they care about is that they're not more than three of them sharing one of those wells. Because if you start to have, you have to have more of them, then then have to worry about you know disinfection and, and tank storage and all kinds of stuff get triggered. Regular testing. No. So and there, there, I mean, there are some, the, the, there are some examples of uh, more extensive shared water systems in Danby. They're all in the uh, what we used to call trailer parks and you know, mobile home um, parks. Um, the, the one in South Danby has a pretty, pretty extensive system. And I'm pretty sure that the one that. Um, well, it does now, but rem you were here when they it failed, right? And absolutely. none of those people had water. Yeah. That was pretty awful. And it lasted for a long time. Yeah. But then, but that's an example of, a, of you know, a joint system. Same thing with septic. They got a joint septic system too. Which is mod as you do when it's all under single ownership. That's part of the issues we're going to have to deal with with the with the Hamlet development or, or enabling clusters too. Well, I'd like to read the Caroline um, the Caroline information, and maybe David could just shoot me an email with the link to it, and I'll I can summarize it. I will do that, Rhonda. It's also in the uh, the chat if you want to grab it, but I'll send you an email if you don't. Yeah, that would be good. Um, so are, were there other things? I should share the screen back again. Other tools? Well, that I mean, I, I, would, I want to go back to the, the other, uh, other question of whether we want to limit ourselves to that um, as opposed to tackling the other um, larger issue of identifying um, or, or deciding whether, we, whether to approach the bigger question of what areas to, to um, conserve and how. Um, and, and especially the, the, the roadside development question, which is the, 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 the really hard nut. How are you defining roadside development? Um, development along the road. Um, okay. Lot by lot, which is what we've been getting for the last 40 years, mostly. Um, the, the, you know, a lot of our talk has um, been about protecting you know, large landowners so that they're not driven to sell. Um, that was a really important discussion and, and, and what came of it, I'm really happy um, about. But the reality is where is the, where is the development pressure? It's, it's not somebody coming in and, and buying up a hundred acres and, and putting a road in and, and adding 20 houses, which they could do under our current regulations. Uh, it's people, because it's so expensive to put the roads in. What, what, what's happening is that the, where the roads already exist, the landowners are selling. If they if if they sell anything, they're selling roadside lots. You know, for every every 200 feet of frontage, you're entitled to create a lot. It could be 200 feet wide, and then you could open up and be. It could be. It could be. It could be two acres. It has to be two acres in the low density zone. But it, but it could also be five acres or 25 acres. But as long as it's got that 200 feet. Um, so what governs is how many, how many lot you can create with 200 feet of road frontage. So the, 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 the 200 feet governs the density basically, not the overall the density for the, for the zone. And when we did the, when we did the, um, the zoning last time in down zone, it's called down zoning. We went from the whole town was, the whole low density zone was two acres. You needed that, that was the, in other words, if you had, if you had a hundred acres, you were entitled to 50 houses, 50 lots. Um, with that, and, and you couldn't get that. You couldn't get 50 lots on a on a 100 acre property if you tried. It was basically no zoning at all. Um, we went from two acres to five, um, which does make a difference. So that that starts to enable some set asides of land and avoiding you know important agricultural soils, special woods, you know. Um, and we also sidestepped the issue of uh, you know essentially undevelopable areas. Um, we didn't sidestep it. We we had several people who felt very strongly that we shouldn't discount steep slopes, wetlands um, from the equation when determining what how many lots the property was entitled to. So um, 
it, to me, it, it always made more sense to say, if you can't build on it, you shouldn't count it as part as in your determination of how many lots you can build on. If somebody, if somebody owns 50 acres and 30 of it is wetland, um, they shouldn't get the same, um, you know, 10 lot um, that's going to be crowded on the remaining acreage as if somebody had, you know, 50 acres un, 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 encumbered by wetlands or steep slopes. But um, so that's something worth revisiting, uh, is, you know, whether you, you subtract stuff like that, you know, ponds and, and, and uh, wetlands before calculating entitlements. But, um, but, but fundamentally, um, almost none of that matters because that's not the kind of development we're getting. What we're getting is lot by lot along the road. What is the thing that determines how many houses you can get? It's how, it's how many road, re, feet of road frontage you are required to have. And it, we went from 150 feet to 200 feet. Um, I forget how long ago it was. I, I don't remember now whether I was on the town board. I might have been. Uh, and that was a big deal. Uh, we had a lot of pushback from, from property owners who recognized that their equity lies primarily in that road frontage because that's where they can sell the lots. And if you're saying, you know, I've got 300 feet and I could get two lots and now you're going to go to 200 feet and I can only get, I can't get two lots anymore. Made it, it was a big deal. Um, but that's what determines, I mean, we, uh, uh, what, what, how many, um, how many lots you're going to get. Now, if you did do what, what, what David was suggesting, you know, is, is a real large lot. If you went to something like 40 acres, uh, then the acreage is so large that it starts to be impossible to, uh, to line the road, you, you can't get 40 acres on, or 20 acres even on a, on a 200 foot road frontage. Uh, it doesn't matter how big your property is. So, so uh, you know, it, 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 that would sort of remove that, that governing factor, but we're not there. You know, right now we're, we're, we're in a compromise with the large landowners, we retained the two acre uh, density along the roads which is where the lots are being created. So you can create a lot um, at, at a two, it, it, we've got this, this somewhat unnecessarily complicated formula that, that grew out of that, which says you, the number of lots you're entitled to on your property is, is based on either one for every five acres or one for every 200 feet of road frontage, whichever gives you the larger number. Well, but why are we entitling people in the first place? That's what I've been saying all along. The I've town been not... it. and the reason is because there are because they're entitled in the first place. No, no, they're when not. We added if if you're nobody in Newfield has to go to anybody to get permission to decide how many houses they're going to put on their property because they don't have zoning. You know, you, you didn't have to put zoning in place in order to 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 uh, tell them that they could they could they could build on their property. Yeah. That, that's there before you do anything. Adding the zoning added an additional constraint. Now we're saying, well, you need to have at least two acres. Whereas in, New, in Newfield, you don't have to have two acres. You have to, have, you have to be able to satisfy the health department. To, you, you, can, you can put a septic system on it and, and a well. But, well, you know, that's if you because can, the town of Newfield doesn't really care about building. And so they allow it. But that, that but doesn't they don't mean allow the it, Rhonda. Allowing New, it. Rhonda didn't, Rhonda. Newfield didn't do anything to allow it. It simply is the way it is. You, it's, you, it's, it's what you start from and then you add constraints. And we there have added no constraints. no law, rule or regulation that in the state that allows, that says that a person has a right to build. There's nothing. Well, so, so you're implying then that uh, a town would have to enable somebody to build by creating some by passing some sort of law that said, oh, it's okay for you to build? It's just what Dan B has done. You I want to jump in. let you I, build. I, will I'm gonna jump in because I don't think this is a productive use of our time. Rhonda, you're prob we've, you're probably we've, talked right. about, we've talked about this before and it, there's no point in having this conversation in this way. Um, what we do know is that the town board gets to set the amount of development that they want to see and that the town board is voted on by the people of the town. So, um, you know, we can have conversations politically about how much development should be allowed and um, it will be up to the town board to decide that. Um, but I, I don't think it's use, uh, useful uh, 
way to spend time with this group arguing about whether or not we can outlaw all development because that's not something that's going to pass the town board at this point. Um, so yeah, I'd like to focus. Departure, the point of departure has to be the law that's currently in place. You know, we do have zoning in Danby. It does, it does set, um, it, it sets the limits of what can be currently done. And if we're proposing to change it, it's the point of departure. And that's, that's what I was talking about before. When we went, when we went from uh, a previously enshrined um, a uh, um, density of two acres in the low density zone um, with 200 feet of road frontage, I mean 150 feet of road frontage rather, to, to 200 feet of road frontage, that was already a heavy lift. Um, so if we want to be, uh, and the town of Ithaca had a similar uh, experience when they proposed conservation zoning in, in certain areas um, where they proposed going from, I, I think it was five acres to eight acres. Um, and I think they did pull it off, but it wasn't without a lot of pushback. Um, and that was with eight acres. Mm -hmm. So when we had our uh, effort last time, um, we had, we had, we, we, we created lots by permit. Uh, and there were two kinds of lots that you could get permits for instead of having to go to the planning board for approval. And one was um, intended to be uh, large lots, farmettes in effect. Um, if you created a lot that was at least 20 acres, um, you, were, you could get a permit to build a house on it without having any, any approvals or review re required. Uh, and the other one was the legacy lot, which was supposed to happen once every 20 years or something where you, 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 you could chunk off a piece for your, your son, or your daughter, or your cousin or whatever. But, um, and both of those were sort of subverted in the end by changing the numbers. But the real governing issue, the real governor uh, under the current framework is road frontage. And um, if you took all the houses that were built in the last 30 years and you pulled them up close to the road, um, you would see that we've already developed quite a bit uh, in, a, you know, in, in, in the place would feel rather suburban. Uh, and, in, and in some areas it does. Uh, the only reason it, does, it still feels rural it's because a lot of people have chosen to build back in with long driveways. Um, and as Leslie uh, frequently points out, it's less conspicuous, but the, but the habitat fragmentation associated with that is a significant impact. You know, it's, it's, and the hunters will tell you it makes a big difference because the, there's a lot less land that's, that's not interrupted by houses where you, you are constrained from hunting where you didn't used to be. So, um, so Joel, I think that leads to, you know, that is one of the, or that's a few of lot size and kind of bulk and area requirements are a few of the tools in the summary. Um, if there's subdivision limits, density averaging, the sliding scale area based allocation, um, all of yeah, those so, so, right. large we're, lot we're, zoning. They're right, all, different. they're all tools that deal with um, tinkering with the required lot size or the required frontage. Um, I was just looking and you know, in Ulysses, for example, they have um, an ag zone where they, the minimum lot size is two acres, but they require 400 feet of frontage. They have a conservation zone where they require 400 feet of frontage and five acres. They have other zones where they allow one acre and 160 feet of frontage. You know, all of these um, attributes are things that can be adjusted to find yeah. a political compromise that people are comfortable with. Um, and I, th I think you were starting to get at two different things. In addition to those metrics, there's also the, the conversation about where they should be applied. Should we have one zone that's 90% of the town or you know, does it make sense to break apart um, the way you think about uh, Northeast Danby from Southeast Danby. Um, are there, there are different areas where there, you have different goals of um, how you wanna control development that it would make sense to um, tinker with the, the frontage requirement or tinker with the lot size um, and areas where people would support that because none of this matters if you don't have the political support to to pass it, it doesn't matter how how great your idea is. This is uh, true, um, uh, yeah. but 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 you have to have some place to start a conversation. 
Yeah. Um, if if we have identified, and I think we have, you know, the 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 the, the root issue, which is that right now, what's what's governing uh, development in Danby is 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 um, road frontage. Um, the question then becomes, well, um, what can we do to change that that would make a difference in 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 our development pattern, if anything? Mm -hmm. Um, so that that's looking at it from a, a global perspective, and, and and then you make a good point though that that it, you might not apply the same rules everywhere. Yeah. Um, as as Catherine pointed out earlier, and it makes a big difference whether you're plopping a house in an open field, or whether an area is primarily wooded, and you can hide a lot more houses without feeling any different. Yeah. So so maybe maybe that's a, another group that can do some some thinking and come back next month um, about ways to apply some of those thinking. Uh, some of those thoughts. So right now I have um, kind of two two things that we've promised to get back with. Um, one is the stream protection. Um, another is looking at aquifer um, and water availability. And then um, this kind of brings a third. And I, I think three things is probably the most uh, group of this size can reasonably- oh, I, I, quite, I quite agree. Yeah. Read attention to, yeah. Well, I would be I would be certainly uh, very interested in being in part of a subgroup that's going to look at the uh, options for uh, mitigating our, our 200 foot um, the constraint um, uh, development and see if we can't come up with something different that would make it less likely to develop at that at, at that in that way and in that form. I think there's one other thing that we could easily do. And that is to put a buffer around the Danby State Forest and limit how close you can build to the Danby State Forest. Because a lot of the people, I, I agree with you in general, Joel, that a lot of the people are building along the road. But the people that aren't building along the road, and I can na name names, lots of people in South Danby will build all the way back along the boundary of the Danby State Forest. And so, that infringes on the state forest, and I'm really opposed to that. Well, I mean, the uh, it's as I, as I mentioned, a lot of people have chosen to build back in, um, and um, but the driver is they they needed 200 feet of road runners to create that lot. They, when they choose where they put the house, but um, I so think we should be putting a buffer of any, I mean, there are some, you go down Bald Hill Road and there's a person who built a big, a huge garage right on the property line um, next to the Danby State Forest. Uh, there's another person who built a cabin, even though they had a house, they also built a cabin and the, the uh, overhang of the roof actually overhangs onto the Danby State Forest property. Um, it's just, it's ridiculous how infringing these things are. And well, I think you, I think you share with, with Leslie the concern about these long driveways and people building way back in um, with the habitat fragmentation that, that, that results. Um, and that's, that's a separate issue, which, which we, we, we ought to at some point address uh, is, is um, you know, do we want to tell people I mean, you're often in a, in a hamlet will say, you know, the, the, the current thinking is instead of just letting people build any old place, you actually say that you will build to this line uh, rather than, um, you know, not, not relating to what's already there. But the people uh, on Bald Hill Road and the people on Curtis Road uh, both have placed their garages right near the road, but right next to the Danby State Forest. Mm -hmm. So we had we had some of this discussion. We had some of this discussion in the uh, you know if you remember in the uh, comprehensive plan implementation task force at one point where we were talking about the issue that you raised, which was the people build choosing to build behind somebody who's already there, uh, and and we had a pretty good discussion I recall of, of how far apart do the houses have to be before they feel like they're uh, encroaching on you so to speak you know because people buy property. Um, hardly anybody likes it when somebody puts something behind them, you know, the, 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 you know they're, they're, they're losing their, their, their connection to nature in the same sense, you know, when, 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 the, when, you, when, when you don't have that. Um, 
right. situation any longer. And we don't have any, we, right now we don't have any regulation of that. We, and what we, what we came to, but we didn't do anything about was, was that, that, we, that the houses need to be at least 300 feet apart in order for them not to feel like they're encroaching. Right. And that, that is influenced by you know, whether it's wooded or open, open field, but that was like the, the minimum distance that separation distance that most of the people in the group at the time thought was appropriate in a low density zone where you're trying to maintain rural character. Well, but it doesn't that's address another discussion. But getting right. back to the DMB um, State Forest, you can put a, a buffer conservation zone around all boundaries of the DMB State Forest. And that would go a long way to, <laughs> to preserving land, but also protecting it for wildlife. Well, um, you know, the the how how do we Leslie does, has her hand up. Who does? Leslie, yes. Not again. Go ahead, um, Leslie. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, feel free to jump in because I, I can't see everybody. So if somebody puts their hands up, I, I don't mean to cut anybody off. But no. <laughs> um, I, I, there was just something that you said, and I, I had it right then, but now it's been a little while. But you talked, you talk about what, like, you're, what you're going to be looking at is this 200 foot frontage thing, and and I wanted to say no. I mean. The, who's you know one that's like identifying a problem before we've decided that that is a problem but i mean looking at options like what you know if we do this then we get this or so right. you know I, right. because i don't i i you and i sort of disagree on some of the some of the what's the problem thing but but i, I don't want i mean i don't want you to go well, you've already done it, so you don't even have to do any research. You've probably got it all right there in your head about what the problem is with the 200 foot frontage. Well, no, but, yeah, I, but, but I the solution, a, I have by no means do I have the solution in my head. I think this is not an easy issue to address. But I don't want you to spend a lot of time, think, and that, maybe I'm off the wall, but I didn't want you to spend a lot of time finding a solution to that when I, you know, maybe that's not even the problem. But and maybe it's not the problem everywhere. And I mean, I keep hearing that maybe we want to think about doing different things in different areas of town, or um, yeah, you know, maybe right. in the north, north that's different than in the south. Um, but you know, I, I'd rather hear more of a okay when you have this expectation or regulation, then this is what you get. Um, but I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm off the wall, but I. I no, didn't... you're not. There's there's two basic approaches here, and, and that was what I was alluding to earlier. So you can you can look at the tools, and 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 see what they'll do for you, or you can look at the or you can look and see at what you want to protect, and then try to find the tools to to do it with. Um, and looking at, and and this other one approach is is, is sort of saying, well, look, what what's what's governing our development here? Um, we're not we're not. I mean, you're getting at you know are, is is it the right is it happening in the right way? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and, and there's where we, you know, we might, we might quibble about, you know, what's more important? Is it the aesthetic impacts of the, of the, of the changing landscape or is it the impact on the, or the overall impact on the environment? Um, but either way, you know, the, 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 the governing, um, the driver, if you will, of the impacts one way or another is, the, is what's allowed. And, you know, what's allowed Means that you can have a house every 200 feet, and if and, and then you know is it is it better for the house to be up close to the road, um, or back in? Um, well, whether it's better depends on what you're trying to preserve. But either way, you're getting more houses than it is compatible with maintaining rural character. If you go unless you figure out something else to do, because if you if you just build that out to the extent that it's currently allowed. Um, I don't care what you do, but you're not, you're, it's not going to be very rural by the time you get done. But Joel, that only becomes a problem if people want to build it out. I mean, if, if every 200... Well, that's true, but uh, the, yeah. The question is, is that really going to happen? Is that really the driving force sort behind development? <laughs> ought that 200-foot ought that rule to be the one that uh, we focus on? Or is it, is it, are we making uh, more of it than it really is as a problem? I think maybe that's a useful question that we could do some research on by looking at what um, what are the size of subdivisions that we're getting. Um, this is something I've run into other places where 
you know, I was working with a community that was looking at moving from five acre minimum to eight acre minimum. Mm -hmm. and there was this huge, oh, we couldn't possibly do that. It would take all our value away. Um, and, and then we looked at, oh, well, what are people doing? What subdivisions are people right. doing? And most of the subdivisions people were doing were 10 acres. Right. So right. two, you exactly. know, whether it was five or eight wasn't really, you know, it was material on the margins. There were some people who, you know, if you only had enough to get uh, five and eight would preclude you from doing it, it, it was a major barrier. But if you're cutting off pieces of your 100 acre lot, most people were doing 10, 12, 15 acre lots at the at a time. So um, maybe kind of calibrating or, or yeah. I don't know if maybe Jason did this already. Um, so jump in. Well, we you know based on what the planning board's been seeing, you know what what we, what we've gotten is uh, the original chunk offs might be eight acres, ten acres, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know a few years later the people who bought those eight acres come back and want to divide it in two or divide it in three. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things though that uh, I'm concerned about is, for example, someone right up the road from me posted on Facebook a picture of a bear right at their front door. Mm -hmm. Now, this property borders the Danby State Forest. <laughs> and so, the, I mean, they thought this was funny. Oh, look, here's a bear at our front door. But not everybody would think that's funny. You know, there are people with small children that would say, oh, a bear, I don't want a bear eating my children. Mm -hmm. And then we have a conflict. Why? Because they're infringing on the bear's natural space. And so, you know, this is going to happen if we are not careful about where we allow these houses to be built. I think, I think with that said, um, we're, we're past the 8.30 that we were looking at to end this meeting. Well, we I wasn't some... committed to 8.30, but, you know, certainly we don't want to run past 9.00. Um... Yeah. Uh, 8 30 is good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, well, I haven't, uh, I haven't got, a, I mean, apart from indicating that I was interested in looking at uh, ways to um, find an alternative driver, if you will, of, of development that than the, uh, the 400 foot, the 200 foot constraint. Um, I didn't, I didn't hear anybody else feeling like this is something they wanted to spend their time um, on. I, I would rather do it later, I think, and try to get the easy stuff done first so that we have some successes. I mean, we, we say, oh, at least we've gotten this done and this done and this done, and then start looking at the other stuff. You know, that's a well, little harder to make a decision on. Where we are now is we, we, we're looking at the aquifers, well, not aquifers, repairing corridors. Uh, and then that over, overlay zone um, thing with the, the group um, picking up where we left off to pursue that further. Um, and that's where we are, right? There's nothing, there's nothing. Uh, what, what were the two groups, David? Um, it was uh, Rhonda, Leslie, and Toby looking at stream protection. Mm -hmm. um, and no one other than Rhonda uh, volunteered to look at aquifer protection or um, adequate water for subdivisions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, we started talking about uh, looking at looking at the size and um, setback and width requirements for for lots that you were interested in. <laughs> helpful to know what what are what are towns doing and what are they getting what and or and or like you said what what has Danby seen what what are what are the sizes mm -hmm. are they all, are they well, all I mean, well steve could i mean, I mean, I mean probably provide some data in that you know is what are we getting i know he can be building stuff but, but i mean um i mean he came up with all the figures on how many houses and stuff but um what size the lots are is you have to come back and see what the what the track record of uh, subdivision creation is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> do, I, do we do we have that data anywhere, David? Not that I know of, but it's not. It's definitely something that we I can look into. 
could be pieced together um, going back yeah. with the um, we at least have a few years of the town of the planning board approving the subdivisions now where for a while we didn't have any idea what was going on because it was just happening by permit yeah yeah so we I'm could go gonna... back a few years and see what's what's the size of lots and what's the width of them and what's really driving um, yeah, I mean, it would, be, it would be good to either validate or disprove uh, my contention that the, the 200 feet of road frontage is actually um, what's determining what we're getting. Uh, you know, if, if it turns out that, that the lots of average lot being created has, you know, 600 feet of road frontage and is 20 acres or 80 acres or whatever, um, then I would be surprised and relieved. Yeah. Um, Are you also thinking, Joel, that maybe... 200 acre, 200 foot or even less might be okay in certain areas. Yeah, I, mean, I think. I mean, I'm thinking that in in the in the hamlets at least we might we we might want, and and we already have some provision for less, but you certainly wouldn't want in the hamlet development areas to be spreading the houses out. You want to cluster them closer together. So um, it's only it's it's just a question of if you're trying to protect open space. Um, you know, having having a lot every 200 feet uh, doesn't, I don't think does the trick. Yeah, well, I, I think this is something to, to do some analysis of and bring back um, and also maybe include in there, you know, if you had 10,000 feet of frontage, would it be better to have that broken down into uh, 50 pieces that are all the same size and spread development along the whole road, or would it be better to allow them to be much smaller and cluster um, in one or a few different parts of that road and then have half of it still empty? Yeah, uh, that, that's also. Yeah, and then and I think that idea was broached some time ago, but I'd sort of forgotten about it. Was if you had a, if you had, uh, you know, you, you didn't have to have them every 200 feet, but you could you could have it less if you if you kind of want to squish them together on one in one area so that you could open up you know avoid open fields or something you know do, do we have a lot of spots where that's a possibility joel right. i mean i'm just wondering how many how many huge lots do we you know we have that's any? a that's a very good question especially with respect to road frontage because we've been developing the road frontage for a long time and there are, there aren't that many large stretches of road frontage undeveloped <laughs> or not broken up um, already. Yeah, so those seem like kind of research and GIS and data things that I could help with and come back with some information next time. Yeah, um, okay. But I'm feeling like that's kind of the end of energy I have for coming up with yeah. new things before to work we, on. Before another we go. Thing, another when, thing um, that maybe the CAC could look into is that Shelley Cooper had requested that this was probably two years ago, had requested that there be a conservation zone on her part of Updike Road. And there may be other people who also would like to have something like that. So, you know, instead of looking for an easement, what would a conservation zone be like and how would it work in certain parts of the town? That's it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, that, that's, I think that's, that's part the of the. Well, so go ahead. Oh, uh, that's just. I think that's similar to what um, Joel was talking about of having different controls, different sizes, different widths required for different areas depending on the context. If there's areas where everyone on a block wants to, you know, require 800 feet for any new house, um, great. Let's find those areas and zone them that way. So how do you, I mean, the, that would be something for the CAC. So maybe- well, at No, the it could be part of it. I mean, the CAC could inform it and participate, but you know, the, the, the um, it's outside the purview really of the CAC um, to be addressing the zoning questions. The, the, CAC's, the CAC really is focused on, on, on non-regulatory approaches to um, land protection. So it's voluntary measures that are that are the CAC's focus. Right, but you would get people to volunteer. They would volunteer as a group to have 
Well, you they know, would volunteer. Yeah, you know, getting them to volunteer to be zoned one way. You're, 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 you know, the zoning is the is the regulatory approach. Yeah, I th I think this is something that um, we can play into and continue yeah. talking about in the next meeting. Yeah, I mean that's what you know um, that, that that's the cool I, stuff in my opinion. Up. But uh, be, the one thing I want to make sure we do before we before we break up is determine when we're going to meet next, if Excellent. we can. Um, I suspect most people would rather we didn't meet on a Friday night, but. Um, Why, what else are you doing? <laughs> it's okay with it's okay with me. It's probably okay with most everybody else is here as well. But um, we might have other people here if we if it weren't Friday. <laughs> uh, or oh, do you just want to have some? Want to have Dave do a doodle poll again, or, or oh, why not? Well, I was wondering whether we could whether we could establish a regular time. Um, you know, like I, I hesitate to suggest. You know, the the fourth Friday, but um, uh, eventually that'll be not good. But but, it, but I mean that would work. I'm, I'm sure um, there aren't too many meetings scheduled in that time slot. But what, why do you want to do that? I mean, I think having meeting meetings at different times means that you bring in different people. Oh, good idea. Yeah. Yeah, there, this is true. I mean, that's, that's the flip side is that if you um, move it around and plus, um, but it also means that people, you know, people don't, don't have it uh, scheduled far enough ahead on the calendar that they make sure they don't do something else. Yeah. Well, I could meet, sometimes I can meet even during the day, like at 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and, and you know, and 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 the and the, uh, the the committees can can meet anytime they want to in between here. You know, we don't have to. Um, it's just it's just it's just this whole group getting together. That's that maybe maybe the dual poll is the best way to do it. And, and and we also decide, you know, when are we going to get together? Are we talking about a month. If you recall in the beginning when things were going fast and furious, we were saying, well, let's meet in two weeks. But um, um, that gets pretty hard to sustain pretty quick um, when you need the kind of planning resources that. Um, we do, and and David is only um, this is only one of the many things that, that are on his plate. So, um, are we looking at a month, more or less, and and, and, so. doing, and doing a doodle poll to to find it? Sure. Well, February is a short month anyway. Yeah, yeah. I okay. Liked your, but, um, I liked your not your anonymous doodle poll. Yeah, that was kind of a cool thing. I've never seen that done before. Yeah, I haven't either. But I, well, I you don't know. You don't know what anybody else is saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't usually do that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could right. even play that one, so it's good that we. Can't. But it's okay. It was. It was okay. Better idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'll send one of those around on Monday. Cool. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, say we should do it sooner problem. rather than later, so we can get it on our calendars and uh, before they fill up. Yeah. Okay, um, sounds good. And can I just okay. quickly ask Rosa if she can, if she can send whatever she, uh, Shelley. I don't know what this Shelley Cooper thing is. So, if you have some information on that, send it to me. Are you talking to me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't hear. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I said sorry, Rhonda. You you raised this, and I'd be. In, I don't. I. I don't know what you're talking about, so I'd be interested in hearing a bit more about it. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, good progress. I think we picked the ball up, and we'll see where it goes from here. Okay. Thank All right, you. Take care. Bye. Thank you, and good evening. Hi, Toby. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Claire.